Boom! Welcome into Sports Bit Betting Inside today, Paulie and Teddy. Weekend preview edition, big game breakdown, the late game Saturday. Oregon and North Carolina. Also, the season's here. Sunday night baseball, the champs are back. The Cubs against the Cardinals, deep dive. Some MLB win totals we like. And we get out of here with the play of the day. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. They were betting the Pistons. I mean, you figure it out. It makes zero sense. Bet up to six and a half at home against the Nets. Nets led by most of the way. Aminali's three at the buzzer to make it look good, but they lose by one, and that was a close game down the stretch, Teddy. Yeah, I mean, Brooklyn led 39-35 at halftime. Let's put it this way. When it comes to energy, okay, Detroit, in this must-win game at home, well, they didn't have a fast break point at halftime. Neither team had a fast break point at halftime. That was a lethargic first half. It was a lethargic second half, too, but a ton of Pistons money, minus five up to minus six and a half. Detroit in a must-win spot. Against a team with nothing to play for, Nets have played a lot harder than the Pistons have over the course of the last month, and they certainly did last night, getting the wire-to-wire spread cover. Pistons, a bad bet. These teams just played, and it was high scoring. I don't understand under money when the Lakers are involved. Minnesota, L.A. total 221.5 to 217.5. Yeah, and this is a, another head-scratcher. You know, I mean, at least with the Pistons, you can understand the thought process. Thought process, of course, is, hey, Detroit's, you know, they got something to play for. Uh, must win, whatever, whatever. For Minnesota and the Lakers in particular, I don't, I can't think of a game that I bet either one of these teams under this year. And I'm not convinced that uh, it's going to happen in the next two weeks uh, before both their season end. Uh, I mean, why the markets are looking to bet the Lakers' defense under at this stage baffles me. Ricky Rubio went off last night, 33 points, 10 assists uh, for Rubio. Although betters, you know, uh, took the gas pipe when it came to the total in this game on the side they got some of it back there was t-wolves money fading the lake show something we've talked about a lot here on sports but minnesota bet from minus 10 and a half to minus 11 and a half they ended up winning by 14. Cavs a bad bet bulls do it again getting five that's 19 in a row at home on thursday night games on tnt Cavs are six and ten this month only other month for lebron with 10 plus losses you got to go back to 2003. yeah they were four and eleven in 2003, and that was November 2003. Was that his rookie season? You know, yeah, I, I mean, for Cleveland to be 6-10, and 10, and again, we don't, it's, 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 this is the regular season, and the Cavs won a title last year. You say, don't push the panic button. Don't push the panic button. I see four teams in the East that can beat Cleveland, and they're prohibitive favorites. Uh, they'll be in, in a series against all of them. Uh, Toronto's live to beat them. Boston's live to beat them. Washington's life to beat him, and don't sleep on the Miami Heat. And hey, maybe Milwaukee's life to beat him too. Uh, maybe I'm overemphasizing this slump for Cleveland, but we haven't seen the good teams that LeBron's been on ever do this. None of them have tanked in March and into April. And the Cavs right now, they're tanking. They are a bad basketball team. Uh, Chicago, 19 <laughs> 0 on TNT Thursday night. That's insane. Bet on streaks, don't bet against them. And uh, that was his rookie season. Uh, bet another bad bet in hockey. The New York Islanders, who needed this to stay in the playoff hunt, they played the Flyers 5 nothing after the first period. It was 4-0, 10 minutes in. Oh, what happened? You rarely see that in hockey. Horrible job. Uh, Islanders made it respectable late, but down 5 nothing at the end of one. That's staggering. Bet for the books, TCU money, the right money, blowout, NIT championship, 88-56. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, Jamie Dixon, uh, Jamie Dixon took TCU a long way in his first season. He really did. And now, with the NIT title under his belt, he can recruit players good enough to win in the Big 12. Uh, I like the look of this program moving forward. And there was nothing but Horn Frogs money last night. Their offense did everything they wanted to against Georgia Tech. Unfortunately, much to the chagrin. Of our for our play of the day on the under in that contest, the game ended up going over by double digit margin with TCU hanging 88 on the number six defense in the country. Oregon, North Carolina, Cubs and Cardinals coming up next, and we'll get to some MLB totals in the deep dive on Sports Bit Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. Back on Sports Bit Betting Inside today. Follow us on Twitter at Paulie Howard at Teddy underscore covers. Big game breakdown. Live odds, sportsbookreview.com, and powered by U Wager. Late game Saturday, half hour after the Zags 
and South Carolina. Oregon, UNC, UNC 4.5, 152 the total. Tar Heels, no strangers to the pressure of this setting or playing in the large dome. Meeks, Jackson, Barry all started in the title game last year against Nova. Hicks, Britton, Pinson all playing big minutes off the bench. Not just the experience of being there last year, but the top six players in the rotation, seniors and juniors, Teddy. Yeah, I mean, North Carolina, there's, there, you, no one can be surprised by North Carolina being in the Final Four. They've been one of the favorites all year long. Veteran squad, as you mentioned, all these guys who played against Nova last year in the championship game, uh, all of them juniors and seniors who've been properly seasoned, and their path to success all season's been really simple. They have offensive balance. They're number six in offense, uh, adjusted efficiency on offense. Four players are scoring more than 12 points per game. And this is something that we've pounded on over and over again here on Sportsbit. Offensive rebounding. They had 598 offensive rebounds this year. 140 of them from Meeks alone. They got f- close to 42% of their own misses. Nobody else was in 2% of them. You know, Baylor was number two. They got 398 they were number one in net rebounding margin. That's what North Carolina is. That's what they does. And Dana Altman knows that. His quote, North Carolina is not going to try to trick you. They pound the offensive boards. Their transition game is off the charts. I think all the guys have realized the significance of it. And we need all five guys rebounding. But it's a Tar Heels team. They're not about to change their stripes right now. This is what they do. They pound the glass. That's how they've been beating teams all year long. Yep, Oregon has enough players of the UNC talent level. Dorsey, MOP candidate. Brooks and Bell will play in the NBA. But is there enough size? As we discussed on the Google Hangout every Thursday at 8 o'clock Pacific, this is where the loss of Boucher could come back to bite him. Ducks number one in the nation in block shots, even after Boucher missed seven games. But Bell is the only big man in the rotation. Brooks is 6'7". Dorsey's 6'4". You got Pritchard and Ennis uh, each 6'2". But it hasn't mattered in the tournament. Because they came back to beat Rhodey, beat Michigan, beat Kansas. None of them with a post presence on offense, but not a great rebounding team at all. Now the issue for Bell is, can he keep this up with stamina, and can he stay out of foul trouble, though? That's the biggest issue, because Bell is a unique player. You know, Jordan Bell was a monster, obviously, last weekend uh, in Oregon's two wins to get here uh, to the Final Four, but... They have no fouls to give. So it's not just about stamina. It's about, stam- about stamina and avoiding the whistles. Now, there is a wild card here that's worth talking about. You know, Cavell Bigby Williams, he has the size. He's 6'11", 230, but he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. He wasn't needed last weekend because of the style of matchups. Only played 16 minutes in the two games, had two points and three rebounds. But there's a chance here that Bigby Williams can at least come in and give Bell some relief and give them five more fouls in a game where they may need every foul they can get. Okay, another big key. What do we make of Barry's ankles? Remember, he left the game early against Kentucky, came back, but that's something to watch too, Teddy. Who knows? It could be a fluke thing. He could roll it again, and all bets are off. Oh, absolutely, and that, in my mind, is a big concern, and that's why there was a lot of movement on this point spread up to five the sportsbook directors that I was talking to were saying this line could go to five and a half. And then all of a sudden, there are more and more concerns about Barry's ankles. You know, uh, he, both of them are hurt. He's injured each one of them in the tournament. And the team made the decision to fly out on Tuesday instead of Wednesday to help Barry. Roy Williams, quote, some people's feet do swell when they get on an airplane. If that's going to happen to Joel, I'd rather happen on Tuesday night than Wednesday night. Hopefully by the time we get to Thursday or Friday, he'll be able to do some things in practice. But I'm scared to death right now because I just don't know. And look, this is an Oregon team that can create matchup problems for North Carolina. They can use their athleticism to pull the Tar Heels bigs away from the basket. You know, if uh, North Carolina gets stuck guarding Dylan Brooks with the Hicks, you know, at 6'10", it's going to be a problem. Then you throw in the issue with Barry's ankles. Yeah, there are some concerns about North Carolina, despite the experience factor. And from a pure talent standpoint, Tar Heels don't have anything on Oregon, even without Boucher. The Ducks can compete man-for-man talent-wise with North Carolina, which is something that we haven't been able to say in many recent seasons. You like the dog, I like the over. All right. Good luck with your over. You, uh, do you love the dog? It's not Again, it's, at this stage of the tournament, 
you're not going to find a lot of bets that you love. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I have a pretty strong opinion on the Gonzaga South Carolina game. This game, the lean is towards Oregon. I have not yet made a bet on the Ducks, and I may not unless I see five and a half either before tip off or perhaps in game. All right, fun break down there. And here it is, Sunday night, ESPN. Cubs and the Cardinals, no line yet. It's Lester against Martinez. Sports bit line, Cubs $1.25 on the road. Seven and a half the total under minus 120. As good as the Cubs are, they win it all. Now they get Schwarber back. How scary is that? And another huge bat. Uh, Chapman gone, but they get Wade Davis to close. Hamill gone, but Montgomery slides into the rotation. They lose Fowler, which will be big, but... You know, you worry about the honeymoon stage, but nobody better than Joe Madden. I think he'll keep him loose. There's so many studs on that team. I think they'll be fine. Uh, Lester, not so, not special in his debut in 2015, just 11 and 12. But last year, 19 and 5 with a 2-4-4, number two in the Cy Young behind Scherzer, and he got better as the season wore on. Two and uh, 10 and 1 with a 1-7-6 after the break. He was awesome in the postseason as well, Teddy. Yeah, sure. Three and one with a 2.02 ERA in the postseason. And three starts versus the Cardinals last year. I'm always interested in the batter pitcher lineups. How about this? In those three starts, he went 2 and 0 with an 0.87 ERA. 21 strikeouts versus 11 hits and three walks over 20.2 innings of work. In other words, he dominated them in all of three meetings. Let's talk about this line for a minute here, where we had, you know, this is again. There's no line right now. The sports projection, and I would say 125. I wouldn't be surprised if the Cubs are 130, uh, somewhere in that range. They'll be short uh, favorites in this ballgame. The total is interesting to talk about with the 7.5. I was like 7, 7.5. Let's do 7.5 under minus 120. Put some sophistication in there uh, for our viewers. Uh, but, again, these are guesstimates, especially when we're talking about opening day. I do not have a great sense of how the market's going to react to these teams. But... We talk about the success of John Lester and the amazing success he had last year. The key for Lester and all the Cubs pitchers a season ago, not just good defense, not just great defense. We're talking about a Chicago Cubs defense that got to balls at a legitimately historic rate. Look at the 2000. I mean, this is a graphic that has to get, you know, to take a minute and look at this. Okay. In 2017, this is, Pitching, batting average on balls in play, BABIP. Uh, you know, when you have a bad BABIP, it means you have bad defense and the, the uh, opposing hitters are finding the gaps against your pitchers. When you, have an, when you have a BABIP that's very good, it means when teams are hitting the ball, they're not hitting it hard, they're not getting uh, balls into the gaps, they're not, uh, the opposing defense is better than average. Well, look at the numbers. It's sick. The, the number two team... In pitching bad bit last year with the Blue Jays at 282. The Cubs were at 255. All right. You look at the last five seasons, the best team in Major League Baseball by year. And every year, you know, it's the Rays at 277 or the A's at 272 or the Blue Jays at 278. Last year, the Cubs at 255. They just weren't better than average defensively. They were way off the charts better than average defensively. And... One has to think there might be some regression in that particular stat, particularly without Dexter Fowler in center and with Schwarber on the field. When you're talking about a historic number over the last five seasons, the best by far, we have to expect some decline from Chicago defensively. All right, for the Cardinals, Martinez not just good, but consistent. 2015, 14 and 7 with an ERA of 3. Last year, 16 and 9 with an ERA of three. Nothing better than strikeouts and ground, ground balls as a combo. 2015, strikeouts per nine innings, 9.2. Look at the ground ball percentage. And 2016, eight strikeouts per nine innings, ground ball rate about the same. Only two NL, NL pitchers finished eight or better and better than 50% the last two seasons, Martinez and Arietta. And now, if it wasn't bad enough that the Cubs lose Fowler, he goes to their rivals and then the division of the Cardinals, Teddy. Yeah, and Fowler's a great fit in St. Louis. A better defense, be more speed, and he's a legit leadoff hitter, something that they lacked last year, which was a very disappointing season uh, for St. Louis. So I'll tell you right now, it's going to be hard to make money with the Cubs. And we talked about this last year. The Cubs were so hot for so long, and now they're the defending World Series champs. They are the ultimate public team. 
and Chicago could win a hundred games this year and be uh, an even money proposition, a break even proposition from a money line perspective. So, in general, from the get go, my thoughts uh, for 2017 is looking to find spots to go against Chicago more than I'll be looking for finding spots uh, to support them. It's particularly with one of their numerous aces on the hill where you're having to lay a price to do so. Live odds, sportsbookreview.com, powered by you wager. Up next, a deep dive, some win totals we like, and MLB in the play of the day on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on sbrpicks.com. Research before you bet. Be sure to check out SPR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more. Wrapping up on Sportsbit, Betting Insight today. Time for the deep dive. Some win totals to go over here. How about the Orioles over 80 and a half? Buck Showalter, great bullpen. The, the starting pitching stunk last year, and they still had a good year. And that's why that's one of the reasons why I love this Baltimore team again this year. They've been consistent money winners throughout the Showalter era, and the reason's been the markets don't respect their starting pitching at all. And again, they're mediocre starting pitching this year. No question. On paper, you say, oh, this team's got a better staff. That team's got a better staff. And yet, when all said and done, what do they have? This might be the best bullpen in baseball. They have an elite bullpen. And they have great power. You know, so you put those two factors together, and you say all they got to do is finish 500 to cash a ticket. Yeah, give me Baltimore over 80 and a half. Yeah, Zach Britton's still warming up trying to get in the uh, play-in game against the uh, Blue Jays. Yeah, well, I'm mean, Machado. I mean, you, 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 this is a guy I want my money on. <laughs> you know, uh, good defensive team, too. How about the Brewers over 70? And, you know, Milwaukee's an interesting story because – I'm not asking. Baltimore, I think, might be pretty good. Milwaukee, I don't think, is going to be real good. But I don't think they're as bad as the markets think they are. You know, uh, they had the rookies last year, Zach Davies and Junior Guerra, two guys who had miserable advanced metric numbers. And everyone says, there's no way they can repeat what they did. Well, maybe they can. And the lineup has some punch. The bullpen looks improved. I'm not bullish on the Pirates. We'll talk about them in a minute. I'm certainly not bullish on Cincinnati in this division. And again, they can finish 20 games under 500. They can go 71 and 91. That'll cash a winning bet. I think Milwaukee's capable of doing that. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. Pirates under 82 and a half. Sure. I mean, you look at the outfield. You know, Polanco, Marte, McCutcheon. That might be the best outfield in baseball. But, <laughs> and it's a big but. You know, you have Garrett Cole. He's loaded with question marks. He's the number one uh, pitcher in the rotation coming off of injury. The back end of that rotation, as I mean, if Cole's your number one, the back end of the rotation is uh, spotty. The bullpen, then the Pirates have always been the, the, the bullpen team. You know, throughout this run over the last, you know, what, five, seven years, they've been really competitive every year. The bullpen in the lead. This year it's not. It's way down from where it's been. And I don't think they can compete with the Cubs. I don't think they can compete with the Cardinals. And that means, as we've seen in recent years, Pittsburgh likely to be a seller at the deadline. Remember what happened last year? when they were sellers of the deadline. They tanked for about 10 days after that, and that was the difference between them making the postseason and not making the postseason. It was the difference between them cashing an overbet versus cashing an underbet. They're sellers of the deadline again this year, and we like to project that. Right here, we talk about win totals. What are they going to be doing come July? Pittsburgh has the feel of a team that's likely to be playing for getting prospects, not for acquiring pieces uh, to win a pennant, and that makes me like the Pirates under 82 and a half wins even more. Going against a big move here. This was 68 and a half, bet up to 73 and a half now, but you think the A's are going to go under? It's not, I mean, it's just one book posted an off-market number and then they took a bunch of money, you know. Uh, South Point had, what, 68 and a half. That was an off-market number. The, the, the marks as a whole have liked Oakland over. And you don't understand why. I mean, for a 15-year span, the A's won 74 more games every single season. Okay, uh, that's a long stretch to cash over bets. But they went 68 and 94 in 2015. They went 69 and 93 last year. And they don't look any better this season. You know, their ace, who do they got? Sonny Gray. He's lined as a 10.5 win pitcher. He's coming off an injury shortened campaign and he's starting the season on the DL. All right. That's your ace. <laughs> you look behind him in the rotation, it's not a lot prettier. And you look at the bullpen. They're like, oh, well, Oakland's got a no-closer problem this year. Yeah, their bullpen is like four bad closers who've been run out of town elsewhere. John Doolittle and Ax John Axford. Uh, Santiago Casilla got run out of, of uh, 
uh, San Francisco and Ryan Madsen. So it's not a good bullpen. It's not a loaded lineup. It's not a good rotation. It's a franchise that's going downhill. Uh, no, I don't want the A's. Uh, the markets can like them all they want. Give me Oakland under 73 and a half. How about the Padres as low as 64 and every professional I talk to still likes them under? I, I don't argue with that concept at all. When you look at San Diego's rotation, I don't think so. I, I, I'm confident there's no worse starting rotation in baseball. Well, oh, it's a it's a joke. It's they Clayton Richard, they got Weaver, they got Cahill. Oh my God, Richards are number one. Richards, you're number one. This is a guy that this is a guy that was barely, almost out of baseball a year and a half ago, you know. And the, the bullpen behind them is every bit as bad as the starters. So every year in baseball, there's going to be one or two teams that are going to lose 100 games, and the Padres certainly have that feel. And you look at the division. Again, the Dodgers are going to be good, and the Giants are going to be good. Arizona has upside. Colorado has upside. San Diego has no upside. So that's the type of team that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a pro or a Joe. Uh, the Padres are universally regarded as being awful, and I plan on ma- making a bunch of money. Uh, on San Diego, they are my are arguably going into the campaign. They might be my number one over team because that pitching is so bad. I think the lineup will hit a little bit, but I think we'll make money betting the Padres over the total on a daily basis. They're going to be lined, you know, seven. Uh, that's a, you know at Petco, and I, I would anticipate this team having a lot of games that go over seven or seven and a half. Money time play of the day. Let's go back to the Orioles over eighty and a half. Like Show Walter, love the bullpen. Everything we talked about earlier. And what they did last year as well, even with an awful rotation, still didn't matter. Over 80 and a half for the Orioles. Huge week of shows coming up. Huge week next week on Sports Bit. Monday, obviously, the championship game preview. We'll also have a two-parter with Rob Vino, and we got the Masters next week. We'll talk to Brady Cannon. You're going to do bullpens with Vino, and it's two parts? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good segment. If you listened to our, 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 our bullpen lineup segment last year, if you watched it, you made money from that information. Our goal is to give you great information again this year. All right, thanks for being a part of the show and an uptick in views. Tell your friends in that Google Hangout Thursdays, 8 o'clock Pacific. Really appreciate all the feedback with that as well. Have a good weekend. We're back Monday on Sports Bit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. <laughs>